This is the uh, final uh, session of uh, IT forensics for system uh, administrators. Follows hot on the heels of uh, part one, which uh, ran from November to January this year and was very popular. And um, the team from DFN have been uh, putting together this uh, part two. Um, I know that many of you have uh, attended and uh, and found it very helpful. So without further ado, Tobias, let me hand over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, welcome everybody as well from my end to this final um, part of the of this series. Um, hopefully you can all hear me well and uh, see my, my slide deck um, and in a minute, hopefully my screen as well. Um, this, second, uh, this is the second part of uh, my persistent storage analysis uh, intro. The first part having been last uh, Wednesday, of course, um, and that at that uh, talk we were mostly discussing um, basics and and how to do stuff with how to get started with uh, with you know basic tools that are there on almost every system. So now we're going to have a look at uh, at more sophisticated tools. So um, the game plan for today is to have a really 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 quick uh, recap of what's been going on. Um, then I'll give you some demo showcase of some select sample tools. This is by no means a comprehensive list. And please do not take this to be the one and only truth. Uh, this is just a few tools that I, I personally find useful and that have been, um, some of them are, are fairly unknown um, generally. Some of them are grandfather-like uh, in, in their reputation in that everybody uses them, and knows them. So uh, this is just a, 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 this, a list that uh, seems to be useful to me. Um, th this is meant as not as a comprehensive uh, training in how to use each and every one of those tools, but more of a you know taste starter to get you maybe interested in looking into one or more of these tools, hopefully. And in the end, of course, this being the last uh, the last talk of the entire series, we do have hopefully some, some questions that we hopefully can answer. Um, but we will certainly, unless things go very wrong, have some time to answer and address questions. All right, so prep remarks. Um, let's just uh, make sure that we're on the same page. So we have some sort of image of the system that we would like to look at, look at and analyze. Um, we have seen in the last intro talk that this is a lot of work. Right, this is a lot of effort, tedious effort, a lot of groundwork. So it'd be really great if we if, if we could come up with some some tools that help us um, take shortcuts, maybe, and uh, do the the boring and uh, tedious stuff for us. Um, for all the demos that I'll be giving here, we'll assume for simplicity that we have one or maybe two raw disk images on our local file system that I can just look at. So uh, no no fancy encryption, no fancy LVM stuff, whatever, just plain raw images. Um, so uh, I have this in this particular talk, skip my uh, the the otherwise mandatory slide that of course once if 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 you suspect that anything goes in any legal direction, then please talk to your lawyers. Um, that goes without saying. I've, I've, you've seen this slide from on my presentations plenty of times, so um, I've just skipped that this time. So, showtime. Um, let's take off with the first tool that uh, I would like to, or rather in this particular case, with the first set of tools that I would like to present. In this case, it's actually more of the idea that's appealing, that I find appealing and that I really like. So it turns out that sometimes, depending on on how you work and on, on your and the circumstances, you may or may not be able to uh, do all the, your forensic stuff at home in your lab. In which case, this may not be as interesting to you. But it may also be the case that you need to go and uh, and do forensics on the road, so to speak. So somewhere else where you don't have access to all your all your lab equipment. So that means that uh, you need to. You need to either bring everything with you, which is tedious, um, or come up with a way of, of uh, doing things on the fly 
And this is where these sets of tools come in um, that a, a Docker user called Table Devil um, has put together. I really like the, the basic idea and this basic concept, um, which is that uh, this guy came up with, or gal, uh, this guy came up with, with the idea of putting all the useful stuff um, into individual Docker containers that are, of course, highly portable as long as you can somehow run um, Docker somewhere and you can update your Docker images, then, uh, then you can just pull and execute these things. As an example, um, or let's have a look at what, what, he, what this guy has come up with. So what, what I find very interesting, for instance, is this uh, Docker image here, um, uh, Kaspersky, which is essentially just a, uh, what it says right here, a simple Ubuntu image um, with a Kaspersky virus scanner. Um, this guy's building and pulling and building uh, the, this Docker image every day. So if you look, have a look at, at the tags here, you can see that the latest is, is actually of today. So he's been building that for, I don't know, years now. Um, and this is, in my opinion, extremely useful, depending, irrespective of whether or not you happen to use Kaspersky, this is, the, the again, this is about the concept. Um, so you can just go ahead and, and uh, I've already pulled the, the Stalker image on my, on my machine here. Um, in fact, I have, I have pulled it last Friday, so this is not even the very, the, the, the most recent uh, version, but it doesn't really matter, I, I guess, for this. Um, for this talk, and I have uh, mounted a uh, Windows demo image, Windows 10 demo image, uh, read-only, of course, <laughs> as we have mentioned and as we have stressed in the in the, in the previous talk. Um, I have mounted this read-only into my file system, so um, now I can just take this uh, this particular Docker image and run it. Um, you have to tell it where the data lives that it's supposed to be looking at. So uh, this this crucial bit, this is the crucial bit um, that you want to that you want to update, um, and then you can just run it, tell it uh, to scan, and it starts a scan service, and we'll just um, have it have it start for a little bit. Of course, since it scans the entire image, this will take a bit. Um, I can only recommend looking through this. We'll uh, leave it run for a minute here in the background. Um, hang on. So um, this guy also has a Clem AV. Uh, Thor is a, 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 a different uh, kind of kind of scanner, APT Hunter, a Plaza Dexray. There is really lots of stuff that that this guy has has put into volatility two, volatility three. Lots of stuff that may, might be useful for you on the road when you want to scan real quick for uh, for a given virus um, threat. So here um, the, the scan has started um, and we'll just um, skip this right now and, and, and abort this. I'm, I suppose you get the idea. So we have uh, already 13,000 files scanned. So you get the picture. This is really neat if you if you don't have a have a uh, have a system handy with you that you know has the the current version of the of your favorite virus scan whatever tool, this of course requires preparation. Come up with your own Docker file, or if if for just a quick scan your content with say Clem AV and Kaspersky, then those two are provided by um, by this guy already, so you can use that just for a quick scan. I find that really really neat and nice. All right. So much for the first demo. Uh, we have, let's now uh, talk about timelining. We have spent quite a bit towards the end of the last talk about getting timelines to work and assembling timelines. Now, timelines for the last talk, we defined as, um, or we only considered timelines that were created by looking at file system objects. But I did already mention that that's only just the tip of the iceberg, really. You can have a lot of sources um, that can feed into a, a timeline. All you need to do really is to 
look at all the sources that you can come up with and then somehow consolidate them, preferably put them into a unique or not, excuse me, not in unique, but a common format so that you can address and filter and process all those, all those timeline events in uh, a common way. And then hopefully you get more out of that. The tool that is most commonly used for this is called Plazo. Uh, in, in Icelandic, the actual name is Plazo Langa Ath Safnaölu. Um, I hope I didn't offend any Icelandic speakers too badly here, um, which roughly Google tells me translates to Plaza wants to sort everything. Um, uh, super timeline, anything, everything the, the, the homepage says, the project homepage says. Um, and uh, I've just noticed a typo here, helps scrape and unify data sources, of course. So um, Plazo is a set of command line utilities, not that many actually, uh, developed from lock to timeline. And uh, this already is a hint of where this came from. Um, because it used to, the very first, the very first implementation of this was, oh, let's, let's look at uh, Unix system logs and parse those and uh, sort them into a unique into, into the unique timeline of the system. Plazo has come a long way since then, since these early days. And of course, um, there's a lot of plugins here. Um, Plazo has, has numerous input filters so numerous data sources can be addressed not only log files but things like windows event logs it can look through uh, browser histories and timestamp those things it can look through um, uh, your uh, search caches it can look at anything basically that you can have a timestamp for and you can of course since since this is all open source as you can see it's on github um, you can also write your own um, your own filter, ingress filters, so that you can attach your own data sources if you wish. As a short um, short demo, let's have a look here. So um, essentially, the most easy way to do to to go through a file system and have Palazzo look at it is to run the psteel command which combines, essentially combines two other commands. Um, Plaza mostly consists of lock to timeline, which I've already mentioned. This scrapes, takes whatever input source you give it, say a file image, uh, excuse me, a disk image, parses and uh, pro processes the data that it finds and essentially dumps it into a Plaza file. In this case, uh, I have prepared for this demo um, uh, a run because this all obviously takes a bit of time, even though this is just um, even though this is just a two gigabyte uh, Debian raw image with mostly nothing in it. Um, processing this raw image takes on the order of uh, twenty or thirty minutes, so too long for you to. That would be an easy demo to do, but uh, kind of boring. So I have pre um, pre run this, and uh, you can actually look into this uh, Plaza file. This is just an SQLite 3. Um, uh, SQLite 3. Uh, hang on. SQLite 3 data database. Hmm. Why doesn't this work? There you go. And uh, it just processes all the events that it can find and dumps them into, into event tables. And you can just, if you don't mistype, of course. No, there you go. See, there's all these events um, parsed and stored in the SQL, SQLite 3 database and all the other um, annotations uh, um, are kept in, in various different tables. Now, of course, this is only useful if you can 
host processes um, the data. It doesn't do you much good in a, in a SQL, uh, SQLite database. Ultimately, you don't want to have a SQLite database, but you want to have some timeline that you can actually uh, look at and, and sensibly process. So there is another tool that will, you, will let you um, uh, grab and uh, evaluate, sort uh, these events, and in particular, filter these events, say, for instance, by time slices or by any other means that you, uh, essentially anything you, you can filter on any, any of those fields um, that you can see there. And that tool will take a plazo file and then output uh, what, is, what, what we all know as a timeline. Now, um, hang on, let me just for, let me clean up a bit. Um, for simplicity's sake, the good folks, uh, the good authors of the Plaza project have uh, also added a third tool, which is called PSteel. And what this is, what, what, what this does is essentially combine both steps, right? So this is the simplest way of grabbing a complete timeline of, of objects that Plazo can, 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 uh, can extract. So um, totally uninterestingly, uh, Plazo grabs this, this, uh, this, this image that I gave it, um, runs it, does its thing. And in the end, we uh, let us not spend too much, uh, too much time looking at that. Um, so in the end, I have already done that and copied it over to this. I copied the the um, the file that is result the that the output file the resulting output file of this run over to here, and we can have a look here. Ah, holy cow! Um, and so what we can see here is this doesn't look much different to the timelines that uh, we have already seen. Except, oh look, here are sources in this in this column. So this the source field tells us where the actual line of data came from. And as you can see, this is all all file system information. So file stat, uh, content modification time. It tells you pretty much exactly what what this is. But if we go to the if we go towards the the end of the file, then oh look, here it has started uh, parsing. Or he, here these log files these excuse me, timeline entries um, originate from the parsing of log files. So this looks like, um, looks like syslog and uh, lo and behold it is, right? So um, not, not a whole lot of interesting stuff happened, but uh, that's, uh, that's what Plazo can, can do for you. And this example of course is just meant to uh, to showcase the general ability. This is uh, way more way more interesting if you look at Windows event logs. If you happen to have a Windows machine to look at, if you can include Windows event logs, if you can include registry entries, um, there's a, a whole lot of stuff that you can um, that you can consolidate into a single uh, into a single unified timeline, um, which then. Can, which you can use then uh, to to jump into other tools um, and to look at stuff and to find stuff hopefully. So, um, but even Plazo is only a command line tool, in, and I say only in quotes in air quotes because personally I'm not much of a graphical guy, but um, so I'm quite content with with uh, busy data and, and and command line tools. Um, but. Uh, I realize there's value to graphical, uh, to, to displaying um, timelines in a graphical way as well. So uh, here's where the next tool that I'd like to showcase comes into play, which is the uh, the file system metadata analysis tool, Fimetis. Uh, Fimetis is actually an academic project um, uh, at the Masaryk University in, in, in the Czech Republic, uh, supported by the CSERT MU. And what it does is it takes timeline files, again, a bunch of formats. Um, the most basic one being the format that uh, the sleuth kit produces. So the general timeline format that we've been using all the time. Um, and it takes that, imports it, and visualizes and filters it. It even comes with a bunch of interesting and very useful filters um, pre-configured. So 
again, this is open source. You can just download it and, and deploy it with your, it has a neat Ansible uh, file that will deploy this service on your own virtual machine if you, if you care to try it out. What does it look like? So I, I already mentioned this is uh, some visualization tools. So what it does is it, excuse me, there you go. It, um, it gives you a, um, a graphical interface, a web, web interface, in fact, where you can import data sets uh, into into cases and then uh, and then look at uh, look at cases. So, for instance, let us look at the at the deb file that we've been playing around with all the time. Um, so here you see, in a nice way, oh look, there's a lot of a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on here. So you can see right away that ah oh, something ha something's happening here in in uh, on that date, and that of course is because um, I've installed the system in the, on that day. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to to draw your attention to these clusters, what's called clusters here, um, and some of these already um, reflect what what uh, what I mentioned in the in the last talk. Um, the stuff that oh the usual suspects that you might want to look at that might look interesting to you. Um, for instance, files starting with a dot. And there's a filter here that oh look, here's all the files that that uh, start with a dot. Root profile, that's that's fine. That's cool. Um, so uh, we can look at at and that's significantly fewer li fewer lines to look at. Um, and in fact, oh look, what's this? That's not supposed to be there. And it con conveniently, I even named the the file I put there uh, rootkit. Um, of course, the attacker will lie very likely not make it as as simple for you to recognize his or her approach. Even though, well, maybe sometimes you never know. Um, so this is this is a very um, very nice feature in my opinion. Can uncheck that again. We can um, look at what what uh, Fimitas thinks uh, are suspect files. Oh, look, yeah, Fimitas agrees. Um, I, in fact, I don't even know precisely what the rule set is behind this this particular um, uh, uh, cluster. Um, but apparently, uh, Fimitas and I agree that uh, that this looks highly suspicious. Um, it can also Fimitas can also uh, uh, let's go back to the dashboard and hang on um, and reload to select a Win 10. We can also um, look at a Windows 10 host to highlight some other things that I think are, are worthwhile. I've already mentioned this, but uh, on, on some file systems, most notably uh, NTFS, the time of a file creation is recorded as well. This is not the case in, in many Unix uh, file systems. Hence, there is no good record of when a file is created or in, in, par in, in, in current parlance, when a file is born. But on an NTFS file system, there is this record. And uh, Fimitas can tell you, oh, look, look, this file was created. These files were created on this day, on this day, on this day. So that's worth, worth looking at. Interestingly, even in Windows, there's a lot of files starting uh, with a dot, um, although it doesn't quite carry the same connotation, of course, as, as in Linux. This is just, I was just kind of surprised, but it's mostly .NET as it turns out. So that makes sense. So again, as I stressed in the last talk, it makes a lot of sense, um, a lot of sense to use all the available information that you can, can get in order to approach a case, um, which means that if you have some prior knowledge as to what might have happened on that system, then it is much easier to pinpoint and find evidence for what's going on. For instance, uh, if you know that there is some, something funky going on, some, somebody installed a rootkit, or uh, there's some, some attacker um, going around in waves right now that, uh, that commonly leaves behind rootkits and etc.funds as we have seen last, uh, last in the last talk. Then of course, using a tool like Fimetis, um, 
allows you to to look at that much easier uh, and much quicker um even though uh, this is nicely visualized uh, knowing where to look always helps in this in this context so and for the final tool we're doing excellent on time that is great for the final tool that i'd like to showcase let's go go, go on to the grandfather of all the um, forensic analysis uh, software toolkits, at least in the open source world. Let's talk about Autopsy. Um, Autopsy has been around for a very long time. It used to be another visualization similar to Femetis, but not quite as snappy because it's, this was the old days back, I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe even longer. Um, and back then it used to merely more or less just display all the information. But nowadays, it has really evolved into a much, much more complex thing. And it's actually, in my opinion, very useful for other features because of other features, not just uh, the timeline display. In fact, I rarely, rarely even ever use uh, timeline displays in graphical timeline visualization uh, with autopsy. I use autopsy for completely different things. Um, let's have a look. What does autopsy do? Autopsy these days is a uh, Java application. Uh, which has its advantages and its drawbacks. Most notably, it's rather resource hungry. But well, so I have imported, uh, again, importing images in, in, in Autopsy takes a long, long time. In fact, um, on the order of hours, just for the image that I have, um, that just for the Windows 10 demo image that I have come up with, uh, which is just 20 gigs and again, essentially nothing in there, uh, but still Autopsy looks at everything. Once you have imported um, a data source in here, I've in this particular instance imported two data sources, one of one just the regular uh, the, the Win Windows 10 demo image that I've come up with, and another another one um, just to demo to, to showcase some other of uh, of um, autopsy's abilities. Um, a a uh, DD image of my uh, my drone SD card just for for uh, you know just for a laugh and uh, so autopsy stores the entire images and as you can see um, autopsy already is different than than, than Fimetis or uh, or uh, VD or whatever because it does not only look at the timeline but it also lets you browse the browse the actual images so you could theoretically um, and in fact you will if if that if you need to find out some some more information you can have a look at the actual file contents um, this is immensely helpful as we can see uh, as we will see um, as if we if we move on uh, and look at if you have a look at what else it does so um, you can it does some it, when you import stuff, it already has, a, 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 similar to Plaza, has a bunch of filters and a bunch of ingress um, uh, modules that will uh, automatically scan all the data, all the metadata out of there, um, do run a lot of correlations. You can configure it to have all, to compute all the file hashes that that it sees, um, uh, hashes of all the files that it sees. You can you can tell it, oh, look, here's a, here's a known bad or known good hash list um, of, of files, if you if you like that. Um, you can import Plazo files. Uh, so, so you have, a, in that case, you obviously only have, have access to the timeline if you don't have the underlying disk image itself. Um, but you can import a lot of stuff. And again, just like Plazo, um, this is open source. You can go ahead and develop. Um, there is an active community for developing ingress modules and report modules. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, so there is really a lot you can you can do here. Now, um, one of the most basic things this does is um, filter and and do uh, um, statistics on on what kind of files are there. So let's see this this uh, Windows image apparently has twelve thousand one hundred fifteen images that Plazo can find. Uh, excuse me, not Plazo. Um, that uh, Autopsy finds. Um, and then if you if you click into this, if the image is still there, as in it's not it's not deleted, um, Autopsy of course will scan the entire volume, not just the file system, but it, and and will de detect um, deleted files as well. Um, even in, even if they're 
um, uh, so that's file carving as well. So originally, um, autopsy was just the front end for the for the uh, sleuth kit, as I mentioned. So um, all that file carving that's going on that I've show, that I've shown you last uh, last week, autopsy can just do as well, and it does. So for instance, just as an example, uh, here's a bunch of deleted files um, that that autopsy has detected. And uh, so this is uh, incredibly useful, incredibly useful. You can also look at, look at at the at the device itself and see, oh, there's a carved file. So in this particular instance, oh look, there's there's a an, a drone image, um, apparently that has been deleted from the SD card, but it has been carved. And so uh, autopsy can recreate it, at least partially, um, because I think this is not full uh, full resolution. And we can check um, by looking at, uh, well, maybe it is full res resolution, who knows? Maybe it's just an artifact. Yeah, it is full resolution. So even in this particular case, um, Autopsy was even able to carve the the full the full image as opposed to just the thumbnail. Um, so this is incredibly useful. Now again, um, if you know what you're looking for, let's say in this particular case, um, you know that some some user um, is up to 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 bad stuff, and you would like to know, oh look, is 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 this what what has this user account obviously has been taken over by an attacker. What what did the attacker do? So um, so there's uh, this this con concept called data data artifacts that will let you look into what happened here. Um, so you have, for instance, a web search history, right? That uh, that autopsy will automatically carve out of all the say Thunderbird profiles. Um, it will it comes across in a given file system. So what you can see here is again this bear in mind the system is extremely extremely fresh and i didn't do much at all right so there there's only what 11 11 entries here on an actually active windows machine this would be very much longer but still it's extremely useful um, because what you can see here right off the bat is that oh look some some user apparently this is the text that was actually um, used in a web search, this one user apparently Googled for Windows 10 rootkit, rootkit download, Windows rootkit GitHub. So, wow, well, that's, this looks interesting. What, so you might wonder what user was this? Well, you can see right here, this is um, in the user profile. This has been found in the user profile of the user John Doe in his Firefox profile. So, ha, huh, this is this is interesting. Um, so, you can we can could then look around in 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 other in, in the file system and snoop around what else is there to find in that particular user's home directory, or we might do other stuff and look around. Oh, look, there's email messages. Um, let's have a look here. So, oh, look, this is from John Doe as well. What does it say? So there is apparently an email um, going from John Doe to Jane Doe, subject account takeover um, with this, with the text, hi Jane, I've succeeded to take over the HPC cluster account, love John. So as you can see, this is extremely powerful. Um, although it takes a lot of, of effort beforehand to get acquainted with, with what this can actually do. Now, um, that's the the, there was a quick look at at the um, at the the text here on the left, um, but what this the, one more thing that that I I um, I might add is there's um, more or less full text searches. So for instance, here here's here's a bunch of email addresses um, that that are found on the system just by full text matching uh, this this nice regular expression. <laughs> Uh, on on the stuff that 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 autopsy finds in the uh, on this image, and uh, surprisingly, there's a lot of email addresses to be found. Um, amongst others, of course, uh, hopefully John Doe. Yeah, there you go. Um, 
So this is really, really, really useful. So another way to do this is um, by these, these tabs here. Um, so there's one tab, let me reopen that. So right here in communications that lets you look at all the communication um, uh, relations that autopsy is able to find and extract from, from an image. In this particular case, there's only email communication going on, but you could see if you, if you this autopsy also supports um, analyzing, say, Android and iPhone images. So you might be able to extract call logs or messenger, um, messenger uh, uh, exchanges, chats, and even you know stuff like contact lists and so on. Um, but in this case, there's only email messages, but still, I mean, here's a message. Um, complete again with all the headers and all the good stuff. Another thing that is really, really nifty is um, Autopsy extracts all the geolocation data it can find, which uh, it then, this interestingly, of, well, not interestingly, but mostly comes from the, um, from the images that I provided with the drone interface, with the drone image. Of course, um, a regular computer may or may not have lots of uh, geotagged locations um, on on its image, mostly usually not, um, but user data may well. So if you upload, if you take a photo with your iPhone and then upload that to your to your account, then that will be geolocated usually, geolocatable, geotagged. And then if you store that on that, if, if that is found on, on such an image, then uh, Autopsy will automatically be able to find that. And oh, look, there's, uh, Lots of lots of drone pictures, and this is not where I live. I just for, for completeness, I I, uh, I fake the coordinates. Um, so you can easily um, build and an build your your narrative of what you think happened, possibly or doesn't happen. This is again very important to realize that uh, there is a lot of data that can easily be misinterpreted here. Uh, the next tab over here is um, the timeline. And um, this does what you think it, it, it would do, um, does the, the general um, uh, visualization of, of the timeline, again, with not just file, um, uh, file events, but also um, uh, event log events and stuff. Um, so, you can, so you can have, uh, you can click here and, and it will give you whatever happened in that time slice. This is not, to me again, not all that interesting. In fact, uh, autopsy can do so much more. The uh, final thing that I'd like to draw your attention to, uh, we'll skip discovery for the moment, that's not quite as interesting here for a short intro, is a generate report. Autopsy will happily um, generate uh, an ex ex a report of whatever, essentially everything that's in here um, and generate a comprehensive, compact, well, compact more or less um, report of, of what, it has found. You can annotate stuff uh, and so on. Of course, um, you can export it in, in a number of, of, of uh, formats. And again, in, in here, that's another thing that you can hook your own modules into um, and have your own report format if if that um, if that suits you better. For the time being, let's uh, you could just uh, run run a an HTML export that's good for looking at stuff for for starters. Um, you can select which data, which data sources to include, and then uh, what what uh, results. If you have tagged anything, um, let's just export everything and just hit, hit finish here. And I have already prepared that as well. Takes a slight bit, so that's this is what what a report in autopsy looks like. Um, this is just essentially what fell out of out of the. The investigation that I just showcased, and again, so you have here the email messages. This um, doesn't look like it, but it con contains the complete message over here. Um, you have the exif metadata with your location fields and whatnot. Um, the search results on here, uh, web cookies, a lot of stuff that you can that you can uh, email accounts, a lot of stuff that you can uh, can think about. So. Autopsy is very, 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 very powerful. Um, mostly, well, it's, it used to be known for timelining uh, visualization. It's much more powerful than that, in my opinion. 
So those are the live demos uh, to wrap up. Again, forensics is a lot of painstaking work looking for needles in the haystack. Um, uh, it's mostly tedious groundwork, um, going through lots and lots of stuff um, and hoping to find that one clue that that unlocks everything. So any automation is, is uh, helpful and is wanted and appreciated. But of course, on the other hand, as you can see, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate um, by this, even just the short limbs I've, I've shown you, all those tools are extremely powerful and thus extremely complex to use. It's not one one button that you can hit and then everything goes automatically. And if, if that was the case, that'd be really bad for people like us. Um, but you, so you need to be, you need to have the time and you need, you need, you need to want to uh, to put the time and the effort in beforehand um, to get to, to know those tools and play around with them and get acquainted more than just clicking around. Um, that helps a lot. And even though it's, there's long stretches of boring, boring work and tedious put work. Um, forensic analysis is really thrilling and fun. Um, so I, I recommend that you be open-minded to all new techniques um, and, and in particular, look at all the tools that come your way. Um, maybe they can help you. Maybe they can provide some new ideas. Like in my case, for instance, the, the one that I showcased, um, all those Docker images, I found that incredibly neat and incredibly useful. Um, and make sure that you practice, 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 take your time and just play around with stuff. Um, and again, I've said this in the last talk, just reiterate because I think it's that important. Uh, for any given investigation, you make sure that you, before you start, you have a clear goal as to, so, so you can say, oh, I've reached this goal or I have not reached this goal and I'll need to look further, further or, or oh, I've reached that goal. So now any more time spent on this investigation is just wasted time. And finally, if there's uh, anything that you can't figure out, don't be afraid to ask others for help, right? Um, we're all standing on the, on the shoulders of giants. Um, so don't be afraid um, to ask around and uh, step up and ask. There's no silly questions. Uh, everybody needs to start somewhere. So this concludes this short demo. I've, um, as planned, left some time, some more time for, uh, for questions and answers, given that this is the the final session of this series. So I imagine there might be questions for even from other modules or from previous talks. Um, enjoy your, your playing around with all the forensic stuff. It's really a lot of fun and really very exhilarating, even though it might be tedious and boring uh, in, in some, sometimes. Thanks for your attention. Any questions, right now is the time. And Thank I'll... you, Tobias. That was great. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know if there are any uh, any questions. Um, you can either ask to be unmuted or um, stick them in the chat box. Uh, be interesting to know if any of you have uh, experience of using any of the tools that Tobias has talked about so far, Fimentis, Autopsy, Plazo, uh, and if so, what was your experience of that? So there is a question of Dan Kula. Um, the, he's asking for a URL to the slides and the and the links. So the URLs uh, that I have mentioned are uh, also URLs in the PDF. So your question comes down to where to get the slides. And uh, to that, I can say, I'll make the slides available to Sarah. So Jean needs to redistribute them somehow. Thank you. Yes. Um... I know Stefan's put the uh, the link on. Yeah, yeah. Well, GFN that's right. We, we publish site, our so... trainings, of course, as well. So yeah, the our slides uh, are available on our webpage as well. So that includes mine, yeah. of course. We will, as soon we'll as say, I get, um, as soon as I get sure. uh, to to share them with the proper colleagues. <laughs> yeah, Real soon and on. we'll also publish them uh, as Jayant as well. Um, what I'll do afterwards is to um, send out an email to everybody who registered for this whole series, whether you just attended one or all five of them. Um, and I will let you know uh, the link so that you can find everything. So there's a question, is there any material to in practice uh, to practice using the SleuthKit command line tools as an alternative to the autopsy GUI? Um, uh, I'm not sure whether you're referring to um, uh, 
training material as in uh, the, the talks or slides or documentation as to how to use TSK command line tools or practice images? Um, the answer the answer for both, of course, is yes, there, there is. Um, there is, uh, if, you, if you search for a uh, SleuthKit uh, demo or uh, if you just Google um, SleuthKit training, um, there's plenty of stuff. And really for the command line tools, it comes down to, uh, unfortunately, as, as so often, uh, read the manual. Um, that helps a lot. Um, but there is plenty of, of at least um, uh, starting starter uh, material that will get you going. I don't have any any current concrete URLs um, right off the bat with me, um, but I can I can get them I can get you some pointers um, uh, later if you if you like um, drop, drop me an, an email or or contact uh, Jean and they'll they'll uh, be happy to to share. Um, this is another question for uh, Jean. Um, I think could you share yes, the YouTube uh, channel yes, for this course? Can. Yes, we will. Absolutely. So I will email uh, everybody reminding you of the, the link um, as soon as we've put up uh, all the recordings and the slides as well. Who else? It'd right. uh, be interesting to know uh, whether people have a process for uh, IT forensics analysis at the moment, does it happen very ad hoc? Is there, um, yeah, is, are any of you using the tools uh, that Tobias has mentioned here or any that have been mentioned in previous sessions as well? Or I'd like to add uh, indeed that I haven't mentioned at all. Um, again, this just to stress that this is not a comp meant to be a comprehensive list of all the tools available. So there might be very well, or I'm sure there are other tools that are incredibly useful that I've just not have the time or don't, don't even know about. Um, and so I haven't mentioned them here. So I, I'm happy to, to uh, for, any, for any of these, uh, any information regarding this uh, as well, if you want to share. Yeah, absolutely. Put that in the chat if you uh, have used other tools that uh, haven't been mentioned. Uh, so um, hash sets for known files. The, so there's um, a few, a few different approaches to this. Um, essentially, uh, there's, uh, that, to my knowledge and to my experience, this is not my strong suit, uh, admittedly. But uh, for Windows systems, there's um, a known good database that is kept by uh, NIST, if I recall correctly. So the National Institute for Standards and T, whatever, technology, maybe. Um, those guys keep a list of known good uh, hashes, which is also referenced in the in the uh, documentation for, for the relevant autopsy modules. Um, so you essentially, if you want to include that uh, in your autopsy scans, then uh, you can just Look at the documentation. Download that hash hash set, and uh, go from there. For Linux, I'm not aware of of any central such a central thing other than what your package management gives you right off the bat. Exactly. Thank you, Stefan. That's exactly what I was talking about. The, the National Software Reference Library. Exactly. Um, for uh, Linux, um, I think I mentioned in the last talk that there's uh, some some uh, some ways, depending on your package management system, so depending really on your distribution, um, that will do local um, uh, checksums, and really it's yeah. So so that's the way I would recommend going there. Um, I am not aware of any single comprehensive hash set for Linux distributions. I think that's probably a far, far shot as possible. And uh, thank you to um, Thomas for uh, popping a note in there saying, yes, you uh, do use other tools which haven't been mentioned today. And you do have experience of using the uh, tools that uh, Tobias mentioned. Uh, I'd love it if you uh, wanted to put uh, another note on how you found those tools and which others you uh, you have used, Thomas. Oh, thanks. So um, another note from Stefan here, there's uh, Circle provides service 
uh, to look up hashes. Thanks, William, for your comments. Uh, you're going to uh, perfect that. Uh, another comment from GH as well, uh, Tobias. Yes, um, so GH notes that, of course, uh, just change routing into, into, a, uh, into a suspect machine image, uh, mount that and change root into that. That's obviously not the, not the greatest idea because if there's infected binaries in there and you run those, then obviously you have, um, you have an issue. <laughs> Um, having said that, the usual suspects, uh, the usual toolkits, uh, generally um, allow you to to select. Uh, they they pretty much very distinctly um, distinguish between the tools that they are running and uh, the data that they are ingesting for uh, for comparison. Um, so you can uh, you can provide a um, a directory. Oh, look, take your take your executables from here, but uh, look, take the database from from over yonder and all the data you look at from over yonder. So, um, but yeah, it, I appreciate the, the you're totally correct. I appreciate the, your comment. Running something off a off a suspected bad system is generally not a good idea. Thanks, Stefan, for uh, Stefan for sending the uh, circ, circle link. Uh, that's another one that uh, some of you might like to try out. And I'll put another question in there uh, just uh, to add to the mix. What has most struck you from this session or this whole series? Uh, I'd be interested on any reflections on that too. I know some of you have attended. Uh, all the sessions, others have dipped in and out and uh, perhaps hope to catch up with them uh, later. But yeah, any reflections would be uh, would be interesting. Okay, well, I think that might be the end of the comments or question. Oh no, here's another one. Uh, GH, thank you. Found it interesting to see how volume two and volume three different. Vol two, vol yeah. three. Volatility, actually. Um, volatility. Sorry. Toolkit. <laughs> My bad. Never mind. <clears throat> and another comment. Uh, what struck me most is how many places there are to hide malicious data, yeah. and how many data sources can be helpful yeah. for an analysis. Yes, um, that is baffling. Uh, and let me point out that we only skimmed the surface here. Um, this was just examples, right? There's an infinite amount of, of, of almost uh, of, of places where you can hide stuff um, if you really want to. So um, let's hope that attackers are not uh, are not as sophisticated, <laughs> because I think if 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 somebody we've seen that in the past, of course, um, the really really well well done um, attacks are nearly impossible to, to trace and detect. Yes, so it's unfortunately, it seems like a problem that's not going to go away anytime soon. So uh, really required a lot of uh, planning and investigation time. Thank you for the comments. Uh, another one here. Yes. Um, and that is um, that is true as well. So um, on 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 bare metal servers, um, BNC and and uh, so management console, um, the management console itself is is a source of constant uh, sorrow in this regard. As there is um, there is malware for management consoles, of course, um, and that is really really persistent. As I might add, there's uh, as there's malware on found. Um, there has been malware found for uh, that resides on uh, hard disk controllers. Um, so that's interesting to, to remove as well. Basically, it's game over. Yeah, uh, hopefully you saw the um, follow up comments from uh, Pascal. It seems easier than you'd assume to compromise the no. BMC firmware. <laughs> it's, it certainly is, yeah. Like I said, BMC is a, is a source of constant uh, fun. Um, uh, you also need to be careful when you um, when you look at uh, BMCs from from a Blue Hat perspective. 
Um, I personally did a did a, a scan, an innocent scan of a Connect scan, SSH Connect scan on on a, um, on a data center uh, once, um, and just did an SSH handshake to to get the SSH version. And it turns out that some vendors, BMCs, didn't take well to having uh, an SSH connection opened and closed again real real quickly. Uh, so um, I actually threw over a bunch of racks worth of of um, ESX servers. I don't know what brand hardware it was, frankly, um, but it, it, people were pissed at me <laughs> for, for throwing over it. The, the actual they could only fix the the BMC. They could only get the BMC working again by actually taking power off the system, which, needless to say, was not exactly what they would wanted to do. Yeah, there's plenty of interesting stories with not only with BMCs, but also with BMCs. That is true. And thank you also to Randy for your comment as well, um, that the uh, memory analysis will be particularly challenging. Oh, sorry, some very loud planes coming overhead, probably uh, planning for the flyover that we're having this weekend. <laughs> so yeah, um, again, like I said, forensics is tedious work. Um, and, and, and memory analysis even more so uh, and it's very complex and complicated um, because the actual groundwork is tedious and you could do it theoretically with paper and pencil but it's so tedious that you can it's hardly doable so you need all the toolkits all the toolkits volatility and stuff and in order for those to work properly that's it's they need to be worked very very well and you know really know what what you're doing to get that to get good results out of there um, that is completely true that's why. That's exactly why I mentioned. Um, take a look at these tools. At these tools before you need them. Um, if you need them, then it's actually too late for the more complex tools. Yep. Yeah, wise advice there. Or at least um, you know. At least it, it's it's also helpful if you realize that oh look that we need more complex tools and I not I'm not really savvy enough with this particular tool tool that would be needed here. Um, then I strongly advise you to go go find someone who does who does know this this tool. That that'll get you farther than if you spend endless hours trying to poke around and may possibly even um, taint evidence or or kill traces or something. Do you recommend outsourcing if organizations don't have enough um, expertise in house or time in house um, to to deal with these sorts of processes? Uh, or does that carry uh, a security risk of its own, uh, uh, giving it to a third party? Is, is, is this a question for me? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so yeah, obviously, uh, as you mentioned, there's this um, a double edged sword. Um, on one hand, you don't, what's your choice? I mean, if you don't have the expertise, you're, there's not, not a magic wand, one that you can you know, just wave and have the expertise all, all of a sudden. So if you, if in, if you need the expertise, um, then there's frankly not, not a whole lot you can do except outsourcing. Having said that, um, of course there's a um, uh, there's a risk there. But usually, if you if you go to if you turn to pro, to reputable companies, then well, that risk is not overly overly great in my opinion. Um, but of course, it's it's a question of of, uh, of money and resources as well. Um, so yeah. It's a, as always, a cost benefit, not as, as obvious. Is there a good open source playbook somewhere for forensic investigations? So a general guideline, you mean? Um, so uh, the, the classic uh, Vice Venema's, um, Vice Venema has, a, has published a book, Forensic Analysis, um, that is the classic, not sure, covers the principles. Um, so might be what you're looking for, uh, might not be what you're looking for, depending on what, you know, flight level sort of, so to speak, um, you're looking for. If you're, if you're asking for a high level general approach, then that might be right. If you're looking for a checklist that you can co copy and paste commands from, then definitely not. Um, that's not the, then that's not for you. Um, and those nitty gritty checklists are really so, there's some, depending on context, I know it, 
that that KIT cert has published some for uh, Linux systems. Um, I'm not sure how well kept these are, but they they have been current, um, so that might be worth a look. Uh, there's certainly others as well, but um, again, if it's it's good to look around um, and take take in anything that you can get your hands on and decide for yourself whether that's a good idea or not. Um, but I'm, I don't think, I, I, know, I don't know of any master, central master checklist that there is. Nice oh, feedback from Matt Andreas oh, Bischoff. The sessions here are worth a, a commercial IT security cost. <laughs> Yeah, so GH, um, if you write one, let, let me know. I'm happy to, <laughs> again, the same goes for me. I mean, I, I'd like to learn as well from other people. You I'm sure you come up with, with stuff that uh, I didn't um, think of. So let us know. Um, also, if anybody needs my bank details to, to send me some money. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, again, thanks. I, I suppose that's it then, Sarah? Yes. Since it's yeah, 12, uh, so, we have um, got to the time and... Uh... Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tobias, for uh, today's session. And uh, to, I'd like, um, sorry, I'd like also to, to thank you all for, for joining also in uh, Stefan's and, and, and uh, Klaus's name. Thank you all for your attention and your feedback. Much appreciated. And yeah. if there's any questions regarding this, feel free to contact us. Yeah, thank you, Tobias. And uh, yeah, I'd echo that thanks to uh, uh, Stefan and Klaus as well for um, your talks. And thank you to Christine Carl for your uh, help organising this. Uh, it's been great to uh, work with uh, the uh, GN4 project, um, Work Package 8, Task 1. Uh, and uh, this is something we've done in collaboration uh, with the uh, learning and development team here at Shale. So I will uh, send you all a, a link to the recording and uh, slides and thank you all. We will end this, uh, this series here. Thanks a lot. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.